Last week we finished chapter 14. Job uh, finished his answer to Zophar. And this morning we'll pick up verse 15 or chapter 15 and read the full chapter. And uh, Eliphaz re-enters the scene. All right, let's just start reading in chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Then answered Eliphaz the Temanite, and said, Should a wise man utter vain knowledge, and fill his belly with the east wind? Should he reason with unprofitable talk, or with speeches wherewith he can do no good? Yea, the, thou castest off fear, and restrainest prayer before God. For thy mouth uttereth thine iniquity, and thou choosest the tongue of the crafty. Thine own mouth condemneth thee, and not I. Yea, thine own lips testify against thee. Art thou the first man that was born? Or wast thou made before the hills? Hast thou heard the secret of God, and dost thou restrain wisdom to thyself? What knowest thou that we know not? And what understandest thou which is not, a, which is not in us? With us are both the gray-headed and very aged men, much elder than thy father. Are the consolations of God small with thee? Is there any secret thing with thee? Why doth thine heart carry thee away, and what do thy eyes wink at? That thou turnest thy spirit against God, and lettest such words go out of thy mouth. What is man that he should be clean, and he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous? Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints, yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water. I will show thee, hear me, and that, uh, and that which I have seen I will declare, which wise men have told from their fathers and have not hid it, unto whom alone the earth was given, and no stranger passed among them. The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. A dreadful sound is in his ears, and prosperity the destroyer shall come upon him. He believeth not that he shall return out of darkness, and he is uh, waited for of the sword. He wandereth abroad for bread, saying, Where is it? He knoweth that the day of darkness is ready at his hand. Trouble and anguish shall make him afraid. They shall prevail against him as a king ready to the battle. For he stretcheth out his hand against God and stretch, uh, strengtheneth himself against the Almighty. He runneth upon him, even on his neck, upon the thick bosses of his bucklers, because he covereth his face with fatness and maketh callops of fat on his flanks. And he dwelleth in desolate cities and in houses which no man inhabiteth, which are ready to become heaps. He shall not be rich, neither shall his substance continue, neither shall he prolong the perfection thereof upon the earth. He shall not depart out of darkness. The flame shall dry up his branches, and by the breath of his mouth shall he go away. Let him not, or let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. It shall be accomplished before his time, and his branch shall not be green. He shall shake off his unripe grape as the vine, and shall cast off his flower as the olive. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate. And fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. They conceive mischief and bring forth vanity, and their belly prepareth deceit. So Eliphaz, again, hasn't, uh, now for the first time since, since Job chapter 4, uh, he weighs in again. <laughs> and uh, he uh, he's listened to Job's answers. Uh, he's listened to... Uh, the conversations uh, between Job and his, and his other two friends. And he's also listened to Job's uh, uh, conversations with the Almighty. And uh, basically one-sided conversations all, uh, you know, he, he didn't hear God speak audibly to Job, obviously. And so now, after listening to all that and being the first one to speak, he can hold his peace no longer. And so he... It's his turn again to weigh in on Job. And at his first answer, at his first uh, uh, synopsis of Job's situation, uh, though direct and reproving Eliphaz was, uh, Eliphaz was attempting to help Job. 
understand his situation, <laughs> you know, you know, the one that's standing there not going through what Job went through. Uh, he wanted to help Job and, you know, get him to a place of repentance. Um, and, you know, understandably so. He's, he, he came there with good intentions, as we said before when we started out. All of Job's friends came there, no doubt, to uh, comfort Job. You know, I don't, I don't think it was like, you know, you know how many people, you know, want to see a train wreck. <laughs> you know, uh, something happens and, he's, you know, all these people go flocking to the, to the destruction. Uh, I don't think that was the case. I think they sincerely came there uh, grieving for Job and hurting for Job. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're human, so... Uh, they have their opinions, they have their, um, you know, things that they've observed. And so Eliphaz began his uh, counseling of Job, uh, as most likely trying to help him. And he was direct and firm then. But, uh, but now, after listening to Job's harsh rebuttals uh, towards his uh, other two friends, you know, to the miserable comforters, as Job calls them, and groaning complaints to his creator, Eliphaz lays into Job now with a scathing rebuke. Eliphaz is here in these verses is trying to cast doubt on the wisdom that all believe Job to have. Everyone uh, around Job believed he was a wise man, and and now Eliphaz is is, is doubting that. He's casting doubt on that. Um, and accuses him of being filled with hot air, basically. The long and short of it is, uh, he says, uh, should a wise man utter vain knowledge? If you're wise, Job, I mean, you know, you're talking, uh, you're saying some things that are, you know, uh, out there and empty. And then he says, uh, and fill his belly with the east wind. You ever, you know, you ever, t- you ever told somebody, ah, you're full of hot air or something? Uh, that's, that's what Eliphaz is saying Job is. Uh, the east wind, Eliphaz is no doubt referring to what is known uh, in the Near East over there as the Sirocco, a warm, strong, uh, very strong wind, very warm wind uh, in the Mediterranean area over there that brings drought and, uh, and sometimes locusts. Look at Jonah. Look at the book, book of Jonah, chapter 4. The book of Jonah, chapter 4. Keep going all the way to your right. Just past Amos and Obadiah. Jonah, chapter 4, just before Micaiah. Or Micah, I'm sorry. Um, And Jonah, we know Jonah, the story of Jonah. God told him to go down to Nineveh, and he didn't want to, and... God had to send him away, and he finally went down and preached, and God delivered, and Jonah got upset. <laughs> Jonah got upset because God uh, uh, was merciful. Uh, but uh, so Job, you know, sat under a, uh, this gourd, and the Bible says here, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose, verse 7, Jonah chapter 4, and the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered, and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. This is that east wind that Eliphaz is talking about. Also, look at back at Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. Here is uh, Moses in Egypt uh, bringing the plagues upon Pharaoh or the Lord using Moses to bring the plagues upon Pharaoh. And he says here in verse uh, 13, Exodus chapter 10, verse 13, it says, And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And so, um, basically, Eliphaz, that's what he's referring to. He says, Job, you're full of hot air. You're, you know, you're full of this, this east wind. Um, the things that you've been saying, the things that you've been spewing. And it is true that much of what Job has spoken, as Eliphaz says here in verse 3, should he reason with unprofitable talk or speeches, with speeches wherewith he, he can do no good. 
Uh, it's true, a lot of the things that Job has said really, they really aren't doing anybody any good. Um, you know, Job, uh, a man in his situation can be expected to make rash and un- unthoughtful statements. Uh, you know, I mean, you get, in, you, you get in a situation like Job is in, and you're going to, you know, you're going to say things. We, we say things in, just in the situations we find ourselves in today, which is not, nowhere near what Job faced. And sometimes we talk and off the cuff and we, we say things that we don't mean. We say things that without thinking. That's what Job is doing. And, uh, and Eliphaz is pointing that out. But, uh, but, but many of the things that Job has spoken has been right on the money. Especially those things about God, and uh, maybe not the situation, but the the uh, the things that he's spoken about God has has been right. And so Eliphaz is, you know, he's he's generalizing and making general statements that may apply to some things that Job has said, but not everything. Eliphaz obviously isn't listening. Somebody that's uh, you know, like Eliphaz that comes with a you know, without knowing the situation, without knowing the background, what's going on, and then just lambasting in the person with a rebuke because of uh, sin, uh, accusing them of sin, obviously is not some someone that's thinking straight, thinking rationally, and, and listening, and trying to see the whole situation. He says in verse 4 of Job chapter 15, Yea, thou castest off fear and restrainest prayer before God. For the mouth, utter, for thy mouth uttereth thine iniquity, and thou choosest the tongue of the crafty. And thine own mouth condemneth thee, not I. Yea, thine own lips testify against thee. He says he tells Job he's cast in all fear. It is true that Job has seemingly forgone all fear uh, in the attempt to get God to kill him and get him out of his misery. Job is saying things and no doubt saying them to try to provoke God to, you know, send lightning down and destroy him because he's tired of dealing with his flesh, dealing with uh, the, 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 the mourning and dealing with the, uh, the grief. And so he's, you know, talking as a man that's foolish sometimes, you know, with, with no fear of God, seemingly. And Job is being accused of cutting off his prayer life. He says, and, uh, and restrain his prayer before God, Eliphaz, Eliphaz accuses him. Cutting off his prayer life and instead using his time with God to complain and murmur with a crafty tongue. Uh, yes, there are, t- there are things that Job has said that is, uh, you know, Job is not, uh, it's a fact that Job uh, was not, was more or less complaining than he was praying. But there's some praise in there, and there's some things in there that sincerely Job is, uh, is wishing for and, and hoping for. And while it's a fact that Job condemned himself a number of times up to this point, um, Job, Job knew he was condemning himself, though. He <laughs> Turn back to Job chapter 9, if you remember... In Job chapter 9, here Job says something that's almost like, uh, you know, boys, I'm, I'm about to say some things that, uh, that are not uh, going to be pretty, very smart, but, uh, you know, nonetheless, here it goes. He, goes. he says in verse 20 of Job chapter 9, If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. And if I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. So Job, he, he knows he's saying some things that, that are out there, but again, Put yourself in his shoes. Put yourself in his mindset. Uh, back to Job chapter 15, verse 7. Eliphaz says, Art thou the first man that was born? Or wast thou made before the hills? Hast thou heard the secret of God, and dost thou restrain wisdom to thyself? He asks him, he says, Are you, uh, you know, are you, are you Adam? Are you the, the you know, the first one that was uh, uh, existed on earth. Rhetorically speaking, Eliphaz is basically asking Job if he thinks he's wisdom personified. Look at, uh, he says, Are thou, or wast thou made before the hills? Look at your, in your Bibles at Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8.
And although this was written after Eliphaz has made his statements, this is obviously something that was known, that was um, taught from generation to generation. Proverbs chapter 8. And we know this whole chapter, uh, we could read the whole chapter, and it's talking about wisdom. Verse 1, it says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? It uh, says, She standeth in the top of high places. By the way, in the places of the past, so, so gentlemen, uh, the, the Bible likened wisdom to a woman. Amen. Verse 11, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be delivered are not to be compared. Then come down to verse 25. It says, "Before uh, this is wisdom now speaking. It says, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Look also at Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90. Here it's speaking about God Himself. It says, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And so basically Eliphaz is, you know, accusing Job of, of believing that he is wisdom personified, that he is, because uh, as we've seen, Job uh, does not think much of his friend's wisdom. Or he doesn't think much of their thinking that wisdom is going to die with them. Basically, if you remember, Job said, uh, you know, I know that you think you are the people and wisdom shall die with you. But uh, Eliphaz is throwing it right back at him. Then he says in verse 8, thou, hast thou heard the secret of God? The secret of God. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Well, there's something about this phrase, a secret of God. and You know, everybody thinks when they read the Bible that everything was known all the way through, the, through history. And, you know, everybody knew about Christ. And everybody was, you know, in the Old Testament looking forward to the cross. And everybody was just, you know, just saw everything. <laughs> That's not the case. That's not the case. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29 it's, it's easy to think that because we're on the other side of it, looking back and reading, and we're seeing all the, the things that God put in the Old Testament that God had hidden there, that He's revealed every, you know, after the, the cross. There's things that are revealed now that we can understand because of the Holy Spirit of God, not, not, you know, not because we're anything special, but because the Holy Spirit of God uh, is in us. We can see some things that God has taken the, the shades off of. That in the Old Testament, while they they you know they were given prophecies, they were given uh, you know the scriptures, but th these things were hid, hid from them, and that's very clear in the Bible. And why people can't understand that, I have no idea. Uh, willingly ignorant, I guess, is the way the Bible calls it. Verse twenty nine of Deuteronomy chapter twenty nine, the Bible says, "The secret things belong unto the Lord our God." And that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, if God doesn't want anything revealed, it's not going to be revealed. If God doesn't want you to get a hold of something, uh, he, he'll, he'll bl blind your mind to, getting, to grasping it. If he thinks that you need to you know, uh, you know, take baby steps and learn something else first, then you, you're not, you, know, you could sit in church and, and, the, and the preacher be preaching or teaching a, a, you know, on, on a subject and, and you just don't get it. Be patient with God. He'll reveal it to you when you're ready. You know, let, let God have his way with thee. You know, let God uh, mold your mind and, and, and show you. And uh, now, if, now, if you're blinded because, you know, you're not, uh, you know, you're not following God's direction on rightly dividing your Bible and you're not and you're not following God's direction on, you know, praying and, and, and asking God to show you some things. And and you may be, uh, you know, intellectual and you think that you can go to this Bible and correct it. And you think you can go to this Bible and and and, and find fault with it? Then then that's another avenue. <laughs> that's another. I mean, that's another uh, uh, realm. God will mess your mind up. You try to mess with His Bible. Uh, as smart as you may be, God will really do a number on you. Look at uh, Psalms chapter twenty-five. 
Psalms 25. We're talking about the secret things, the secret of God. Psalm 25, you ever, don't you hate when somebody, when you know there's a secret and you, and you can't get the, you know, and you're, it's, it's being hid from you? <laughs> you, you know, there's people in the office or people in at work or, you know, in the church. They got a secret and you just want to know it. God's got secrets. <laughs> Psalm 25, look at verse 14. It says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. And so God does have secrets, but there's, you know, there's some people he'll reveal them to. Thank the Lord. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3, come down to verse 32. The Bible says, For the fraud is abomination to the Lord, excuse me, but his secret is with the righteous. His secret is with the righteous. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23. The secret of God. Eliphaz hasn't heard it, apparently. <laughs> He's asking Job, you, have you heard it? You know what the secret is? <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 18. He says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Again, Jeremiah asking the question. Uh, there's some things that, uh, that, that, are, that were withheld that, that were just uh, you know, unclear to those people in the Old Testament. Look at Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. There's some things that David got. Understood and, and, and were, were given to him that a lot of the people in the Old Testament didn't have. The sure mercies of David. God said, listen, this is what I'm going to do with your son. And he's going to have something that nobody else has. Saul, I took my Holy Spirit from him. Sa you know, uh, Samson, it came and went. And it came back again at the end. He said, but your son, I'll, I'll, I'll rebuke him, I'll correct him when he messes up, but... He's got, he's got it. Eternal security. David didn't understand that. Why? Because David was in that economy. He was in the Old Testament where you didn't have eternal security. You could be doing right for you know, all your life and you go out and pick up sticks on the Sabbath. You're done. But, but God tried to show David some things that, that were special to David. Here in Amos chapter, uh, where are we at? Amos chapter 3, look at verse 7. Says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so God sent, gave his prophets some things that they, were, they wrote down in the Old Testament. They proclaimed again, but they're secrets. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I like this one. Those Pharisees walked around. They, you know, thought they had the word of God, and they, 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 you know, they had the original languages, and they, you know, they had the the knowledge to be able to uh, understand God. While the, you know, the, the publicans and sinners, they they couldn't really grasp it. Kind of like us, huh? We, uh, but Jesus Christ put a put the hooey on them. And he says here, he's praying to God, he says, And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, verse 25 of Matthew chapter 11, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Hey, there were some people that, uh, during Christ's ministry, during Christ's time, that uh, uh, they, were, they weren't the smartest, they weren't the wisest, the twelve men he, he chose, those 12 disciples, they were fishermen, rough, 
you know, they weren't uh, seminary graduates. But uh, God revealed some things to them. And he asked Peter, he said, who do men say that I am? And that, he said, they said, well, some are saying you're Elias and, or, you know, one of the prophets. And he says, but who say ye that I am? And, Christ, and Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Some things that the Pharisees didn't grasp. Some things that the Pharisees couldn't understand. Why? Because they refused to. You refuse to, you refuse to trust God. You refuse to take God at his word and he'll blind you. You don't want to accept truth. Uh, he knows your heart. He, he knows that uh, uh, what kind of heart of faith you have. And if you refuse to accept him by faith and take his word, uh, take him at his word and believe his words, then he's going to blind you. And he told Peter, he said, uh, you know, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee. This wasn't somebody that just came by and, and told you that, you know, I'm the son of God. He said, my father, which is heaven, has revealed it unto thee. And so the secret of God that Eliphaz is asking Job if he knows it, well, you know, the, Job may have been one of those characters in the Old Testament that because he just believed God, that he knew some things that he's, these other three yahoos didn't. And they, ought, they should uh, listen. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 11 says, And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. What's he talking about? His, his disciples in verse 10 asked him, Why are you speaking in parables? Why are you, why are you talking in riddles? He says, Because, you know, I didn't, because you're gonna, I'm, I'm giving these things to you, but I want them to, you know, go crazy in their mind because <laughs> they refuse to believe me. Look at verse 35. You say, that's pretty, pretty mean. Well, that's... That's just the way it is. These these guys that are on these translation committees that uh, that, that corrupt uh, God's word, they're, they God's got their mind full with full of sawdust. Oh, they're very brilliant men, no doubt. Worldly speaking, worldly wisdom, they've got all the knowledge. But when it comes to God and and the things of God, they're Spiritually bankrupt. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 35. He says, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables and will utter, thing, uh, utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Those secret things that God hid in the Old Testament, He's going to utter them in parables and His people were under, going to understand them because they believed Him. And He would, and he would explain and reveal things to them but the Pharisees and those that rejected him, sorry, they couldn't get it. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Look what he said to his disciples here in verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. He said, I've made, I've made known some things unto you because you are my friends. I've, uh, there's some things that you weren't understanding. There's some things he told them that you're still not going to understand. That you're still not going to grasp. And you're not going to get them until after I reveal them later. But uh, he says, but now you're still getting some things. These disciples at this time were still getting some things that revealed to them that were hidden before. Now look at Romans chapter 11. Let's get, let's get us in this picture. Amen. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, come down to verse 34, says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? It's a good question. That's basically a, a question that Eliphaz is asking here to Job. Hast thou heard the secret of God? Do you know the mind of God? Now turn over to chapter 16 of the book of Romans. 
If we left it at that, we'd say, oh, oh, I guess nobody can. Paul's asking that rhetorical question on who can know the mind of God. Well, there's some things that we're not going to understand about God. Even as New New Testament believers, there's some things that we're not going to grasp. There's some things that we're not going to get. He's not going to, he hasn't revealed everything to us. There's, there's things that we don't know about heaven that we're going to be uh, flabbergasted when we get there. But there's some things that you and I, because we have God's word and we have the Holy Spirit of God in us, guiding us into all truth. There's some truths that we get that most of mankind prior to the cross did not get. Look at Romans chapter 16. Look at verses 25 and 26. The Bible says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. Now that's Paul speaking. He's not boasting. It's not, he's not saying that he invented the gospel. He's not the one that made it up. You know, He didn't just think this up on his own fruition. But he's the one that God gave it to and said, This is how people are going to know me uh, from, this hint, from this day forward. Uh, you know, the, obviously it started at the cross and, and was in effect then, but people didn't know it. He gave it to Paul, all right? So in that sense, Paul is a very special character in, in, in the history, in the timeline of, uh, of the church. He says, uh, verse, verse 25 again, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery... Again, it's the revelation of the mystery, not the invention of the mystery, not the start of the mystery, (laughs) the revelation of the mystery. Something that was there in vogue prior to Paul even being born again, but it wasn't revealed. That's why uh, after the cross, everybody freaked out. You know, all the disciples scattered and everybody, you know, they they didn't know what to do now because the one they thought was going to rule and reign with a rod of iron is now dead and in a grave. And then he resurrected, and then, you know, they're excited and, and glad to see that, but they don't know what's going on. They don't, they don't, they don't get it. Now, they're, now he's getting ready to go back to heaven, and they say, Lord, without, at this time, now restore the kingdom to Israel. Now you're going to do it, right? And he says, well, sorry, boys, I'm leaving. <laughs> Heading out. They, they just, they're, they're flabbergasted. They don't understand. Why? Why didn't they just go and read the Bible? <laughs> well, because it wasn't revealed to them. God said, he told his disciples, there's some things that I cannot tell you now. Because you're not going to, it would blow your mind. Amen. But, but after Paul was saved and God said, okay, this is the one I'm going to give these revelations to. Not that Paul started them. That's where the hypers get off the boat and and, and get the church starting with Paul or after Paul, and they're they're nuts. It's, it's, It's very clear that God revealed the mysteries to Paul, not started the mysteries with Paul. He revealed them to Paul. All right? And so the pre, he says, uh, the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. It was a secret. Eliphaz is asking Job in our context, do you know the secret of God, Job? Because I don't know it. (laughs) There was a secret. Eliphaz says, uh, you know, fill us in if you got it. Because I don't know it. You and I, though, can glorify and, and, and praise God because we know it. Amen. We know the secret of God that was hid since the foundation of the world. He revealed it to us. We've got it right here. Here's the secret of God. Anything that God wants man to know, he's revealed it right here. And we can know it. The secret of God. Uh, <clears throat> look at... Uh, you're, you're there in verse 16. We haven't finished verse 26 yet. But now, he says, Paul says, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the co- commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. What did Paul say? Not <clears throat> we know that Paul wrote many epistles where he you know he explained some of the revelations, but Paul just said there that according to the commandment of the everlasting God, and prior to that the scriptures of who 
the prophets. Amen. I mean, now he's unlocked those things that were in the prophets that they didn't understand back then. That they were given, but they were kept in a veil that kept blind their eyes. Now those things that were given to the prophets, we can understand. All right? Not just in Paul's epistles. He's not saying just read what I write. Paul never claimed to, to be the, you know, uh, you know, forget the Old Testament, boys, and just read what I would send you. No, that's not what he said. He said the things that are, in, uh, that are back there are written for our learning, for our admonition. We're supposed to learn from the Old Testament. We're supposed to read the Old Testament. Because those things are revealed now through the Apostle Paul. Yeah, you, you better get your foundation established and, and read the Apostle Paul, you know. Get those under, that understanding, but then you can, have a, you can have a blast in the Old Testament knowing the secret of God. Amen? Uh, it's, 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 just, it's a wonderful thing to know that we've been the secret that Eliphaz didn't know. That Job may have not known. Obviously, Job didn't know about the cross and all that those things, but Eliphaz is asking him, do you know the secret of God? We do. We've got it. Paul says we have it. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <coughs> Verse 2. Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 9. But as it is written, this is, this is a passage from the Old Testament. All right, Paul's quoting. As it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And, and we use that sometimes, you know, I no doubt may have used it before and other preachers use it. To say that there's some things that we just don't know about heaven and God's going to reveal them. And that's, and that's true, but that's not what this verse is talking about. Amen. That's, he, Paul said that's what's written. That's what, what God said. But we forget about verse 10. There's a but God there. Verse 10 says, but God hath revealed them unto us. The things that, that were written in the Old Testament that man couldn't see, that it couldn't even enter into their heart. God has revealed them unto us. Hallelujah. We've, they've been revealed to us. God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, not by our education. Amen? Not, not by our, our brilliance and not by the evolution of man, but by His Spirit. That's how He reveals it. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. You know, we, we get the, there's, there's some guys out there that's all they want to do is, is, is wallow in the deep end. You know, and, and sometimes that makes some preachers upset. And, you know, so they say things about, you know, those deep preachers and, you know. And, and that's true. You need to, yeah, man, get, stay with the basics every once in a while. Come back and, and, you know, get that foundation. Remember some things that you learned as a young youngin. But, but the deep things that God revealed to us, what are we going to do with them? We better study them. We better know them. We better grasp them. He gave them to us for a reason. He says in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So you're not going to get, you know, these guys that are lost, and there's... There's some seminaries and, and, and religious institutions out there trying to teach lost people this book. Trying to teach lost people the secret things of God. And they can, they can go through and they can you know, try to go back into all the original languages and get all the, uh, the, 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 the technical knowledge they can get. But they're not going to not, not be revealed to them until they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. When they trust Him, the floodgates will open. They can memorize verses if they want. They can do all kinds of things, but it's not going to take effect. It's not going to do any work in them until they trust that Christ died for their sins, according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says in verse, uh, um, verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. 
Why did He give us the Spirit? So we can know these things. Amen. He sealed us until the day of redemption. The Spirit's to, to guide us into all truth. It's, he's, he's to be our guide in this life because we have this flesh still. You know, it wants to do wrong. It wants to it continue. It's continually wants to, to, to sin against God. And so He gave us the Holy Spirit within us to guide us, to keep us safe. Amen? We're, we're, we're saved for eternity because we have the Holy Spirit of God. And He's also given the Holy Spirit of God to reveal these secret things to us. Freely. You don't have to pay for it. Amen? Go to college. I, I urge you if, you, can, if God blessed you and you can afford it and you can get the grants or whatever, go and learn something. Bible college, whatever. But know this, that you can get by simply going into God's Word with a believing heart, with a trustful heart, you can get the secret things of God revealed to you freely <laughs> without having to go to college. Amen? Now, college is good. It'll teach you how to study. It'll teach you how to you know, use certain things, and uh, that's what it's for. But if you think you have to go to college to know God, you got the wrong God. He says in verse 12, again, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. <coughs> Come to, uh, let's see. Let's, let's just keep reading. Uh, verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the worlds, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Again, that's how... That's how you study your Bible. It's okay to go to the commentaries and try to get other men's opinions on certain things. But the best way to study your Bible is to go from spiritual things to spiritual things. Just keep running verses back and forth. Finding what verses go along with the verses you're learning or you're wanting to understand. Uh, get a concordance, not for the Greek and Hebrew, but for the uh, location of certain words in your Bible. Or computer program, eSword, or Sword Searcher, or whatever you want to get. And use that to study spiritual things with spiritual. Uh, there's, there's certain commentators out there that have, uh, have the, 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 the wisdom that God gave them because they trusted Him. And they don't try to correct His book. And God will give them wisdom. And it's good to learn from them. Read them. Amen? But understand that you can get those things yourself by studying this book. Spiritual things are spiritual. He says, verse 14, but the natural man, the natural man, who, what's a, who's a natural man? Someone that's lost. So what's that make you and I? If the natural man is a lost man, what's that make you and I? Huh? Supernatural. <laughs> Amen? We're, we're supernatural. We're, we're, you want to be a superhero? Get saved. Amen? You can be supernatural. Now, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, if a saved man that's born again, got the Holy Spirit of God in him, can he resort and try to put all his stock in the natural man and try to, you know, and God will, yeah, God will blind him. These men, I'm sure they're saved men that uh, correct this Bible. I know there are. They're saved and going to heaven. They're going to be in heaven with you and I. But that part of them that doubts God and, and, and thinks they have to correct God's word and thinks that they have to, uh, you know, uh, help us understand God because we're, you know, we don't have that knowledge of the original languages and, uh, you know, all the historical archaeological evidence. That's their natural side. That's their natural man. He says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So a lost man cannot understand. Again, when we witness to people, a lot of times we try to explain God. We try to explain what happened to us logically so they can understand it logically. And it's not going to happen. 
they're not, you're not going to be able to explain it enough for them to say, oh, okay, I get it, I'll get saved. No, they, they've got to know. You tell them exactly what God did to you, and as, as miraculous and, and, and foolish as it sounds to them, until they accept it by faith, they're not going to get it. They're not going to get it. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Uh, you know, so when we're, you know, we're, you might be at work and, 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 and getting, you know, maybe whether you're thinking of what you read in the morning before you went there or, or thinking of a song and it's blessing your heart. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And you're, and you're, you know, and they ask you, well, why are you so happy? Or, you know, what, you know, well, you know, you can tell them, you know, tell them how good God is, but don't expect them to get it unless they're saved. Don't expect them to get it. They need to get saved. The Bible says that the things of God are foolishness unto, the, unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. You know, oh, we're not supposed to judge anybody. Well, when you're carnal, it's a good idea not to. <laughs> Amen. If you're, if you're uh, you know... You've got your your flesh is in control of you and and everything. Then that's probably a good idea not to go around pointing everybody else's flaws out. But when God gives gives you something and gives you victory over something, don't let anybody tell you that. Uh, well, you're just judging me. No, I'm just telling you what the Bible says about it, uh, what He showed me about it. You know, I've gotten victory over it. You can too, but it's wrong. You can tell somebody some things are wrong because what God said, not because you're an expert on it, but because God told you it was wrong. And you've been, you discern those things spiritually. Look at verse 16. Here's again one of those questions. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? If, he, if that's where it ended, it'd be one of those questions. Who can know God? Who, who can know the mind of the Lord? But, but it doesn't in there. <laughs> Amen? It says, but we have the mind of Christ. Wow. We have the mind of Christ. Now, we don't use it very often. We don't, we don't avail ourselves of it often enough. Why? Because, you know, some things that we just don't understand. There's Some people are having grown to that level. Some people have grown to that level and then retarded, as we talked about Wednesday, back to their spiritual childhood. But nonetheless, it's available to us. We have the mind of Christ. You want to get victory over sin? You want to, you want to understand God and uh, understand His Bible? It's available. You just have to avail yourself of it. Just like salvation. Salvation is available to everybody. Christ forgave everybody on the cross. That doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven. Why? Because they don't avail themselves of salvation. All right. We're, we're done for this morning. We'll pick this verse up next week.